Since the first industrial revolution, economic development has been powered by fossil fuels. Coal, oil, and gas have transformed the way we live, produce, consume, and move around. But for decades now, we have known that the greenhouse gases emitted when we burn these fuels are building up in the atmosphere, blocking in heat, raising average global temperatures, and causing climate change. The latest UN climate science report says there is no longer any doubt. To prevent climate catastrophe, we need to switch away from fossil fuels fast. We must forget about net zero. We need real zero. But what about those parts of the world that, while sharing the perils of climate change, have not enjoyed the increased wealth or living standards that come with economic development? No major economy in history has industrialized without the large-scale use of fossil fuels. Is there a way that underdeveloped economies today can pursue economic development without contributing to climate change in the way richer countries have already been doing so for decades or centuries? Can vital economic development happen without making the mistakes of the past and without pushing the world further into climate crisis? Hello and welcome to Stakeholder Capitalism, a show from the World Economic Forum exploring how economies can be made to work for progress, people, and the planet. I'm Natalie Pierce. And I'm Peter Van Hem. And in today's episode, we'll be exploring what is arguably the world's most pressing problem, the climate crisis, and particularly its long and complex relationship with the story of global economic development over the past 200 years. Peter, what do you have to share with us today? So let's look at global annual CO2 emissions from the 19th century to today. When we do that, we see that as the economy developed, the CO2 emissions went up. And right now, they are at about 35 billion tons of CO2 per year. And of course, we need to go down to zero by 2050. We know that that's the challenge to limit global warming very steep decline. So the question is, how are we gonna do that? Well, let's break that question up into two parts. Let's look first at what happened in the West. In the West, Europe, North America, Oceania, you saw that emissions already peaked around 1990 or so, then have plateaued and have started to come down already. So it looks possible, at least there's a path to zero in 2050. That's because of something called the environmental Kuznets curve. It says, as you develop first, you emit much more CO2, then you develop some more, you gain new skills, new knowledge, and you're able to emit less CO2. But let's now look at what happened in Asia, South America, and also Africa, the emerging economies of the world. They haven't reached that phase yet of economic development where they can start to plateau and then go down. In fact, if they were to follow the same logic, they would still go up first and we would never get to net zero by 2050. So that's of course where we need to go. We need to go down to zero. So this shows us the conundrum that we face when it comes to the climate crisis. If we want to curb our emissions quickly by 2050, for example, well, then we don't really have a template of how we can continue economic growth. But if inversely, of course, we follow the template that we do know for economic growth and development, well, then it doesn't look like we can curb CO2 emissions. So in summary, the same force that is lifting millions of people out of poverty is the one that is destroying the livability of our planet for future generations. It appears so because there is a long enduring correlation between economic development and CO2 emissions. Thanks, Peter. In today's episode, we're going to switch things up and we have two expert guests who are joining us for part one, who come from very different backgrounds. First, we have Risa Lat Khan, who is a climate activist from one of the fastest growing economies in the world, Bangladesh. He's also a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers community and is leading the climate initiatives of the Davos Lab. Let's jump in. Hi Risa Lat, it's so great to have you with us today. Great to be here, and uh, thanks for having me. 
Earlier in the episode, we heard from Peter, who showed us a graph linking emissions and global development. Risalat, you have mobilized marches and movements and campaigns to advocate for the move away from fossil fuels. I'm curious, what do you see on the ground, especially in your work in Bangladesh? The first thing to consider is that right now, um, a lot of the world's emissions, like 80% come from G20 countries. So if we are looking at actually the breakdown between where emissions are coming from, it's the biggest uh, economies in the world. When we're speaking of a country like Bangladesh, it is important to put things into that context. That does not mean that countries like Bangladesh do not have a responsibility to do their fair share uh, and peak as soon as possible and, and transition and make that same transition to net zero. But it needs to be done in an equitable way. It is important to have that equity lens in mind and really consider what kind of support is needed. Uh, while everybody should be moving in the direction of net zero, the IEA just came up with a report that said uh, about $850 billion is the funding gap annually that is needed to be met uh, in order to uh, make sure that emerging and developing economies can transition as well. So right now, there is this opportunity that we have to make sure that everyone can make this transition. The technological reality of uh, renewable energy costs falling as much as they have and now being the cheapest source of energy uh, across much of the world uh, now means that uh, there should be no excuse to not move at a rapid pace, but do so equitably. Could you tell us how it feels, this conundrum, let's say, on the ground? On the one hand, you know, how does it feel, the climate urgency or emergency uh, in Bangladesh? And on the other hand, you know, what does it look like, this economic development that's currently taking place? What are, where, where, where do people follow opportunities? I want to share a story that I actually think of very often. Um, this comes from uh, when I was visiting a village outside my home city of Dhaka. Uh, with my father, who is an environmental activist that I drew a lot of guidance and inspiration from. Um, and as we were in that village, I met an old farmer who was working in the field. Um, and I asked him about how he has seen the climate change as he has you know, lived his life in that land. Um, and he shared about how when he was a young man, uh, he had the bounty of like multiple harvests. Bangladesh is a very fertile soil, so he had that. But now he shared really devastating stories of how it's now it would be lucky to have one good harvest in a year, and that is extremely challenging to provide for his family. And then he said something I probably will never forget. He said, Allah has turned his back on us, Baba. Um, so I, I feel that that sense of powerlessness, that loss of agency, uh, I find that one of the gravest uh, injustices of the climate crisis people are having to rebuild, uh, they're being forced to uh, without having a real contribution to the problem. There's no part of the world that is untouched by the climate crisis and the whole world is having to adapt and very quickly. So there is a lot of sharing of knowledge that is uh, needed, that is possible. Uh, because people and communities have been adapting to climate change for a long time. But at the same time, we are reaching very rocky seas um, and some are holding on to a piece of wood while some might have super yachts. And Risalat, maybe can you also share with us, um, let's say, the, the, the story of economic development in Bangladesh today? Because it's, it's, it's actually a booming economy, isn't it? So what, what does that look like uh, in Bangladesh? Is it industrialization as we've known it in many other countries? Is it, does it look different? What is the story of uh, Bangladesh's booming economy? Right now, it is being seen as one of the, as you said, a booming economy, uh, uh, really providing for a backbone of the global uh, garments industry, the fashion industry, often based on models of exploitation, I might add. Yeah, the country is definitely on a track uh, towards economic development. Um, and, and doing well for itself. The human health indicators that Bangladesh has in many ways are uh, examples in the region in terms of how, how far we have come in terms of human development on things like sanitation and water and so on. Yet there are challenges and I, I do consider climate as one of the biggest ones. And while we do have a responsibility to transition like everyone else, some of the things that will actually determine what will happen to the future of the country in terms of, uh, you know, some estimates of sea level rise, some estimates suggest that up to a third or even a half of the country in future could go underwater. 
And when you have a country of more than 160 million people, that means tens of millions displaced uh, mass migration uh, over a period of a very short time. And that would be incredibly difficult for any government to manage. Uh, and it will uh, result in really vast human crisis unless we act very quickly as a world on climate. Yes, and of course also the uh, adverse effects of climate change uh, are not just in the future in Bangladesh, aren't they? They are also in the present. I think that Dhaka, the, the, the capital, is actually one of the worst polluted cities in the world, isn't it? Is that also a consequence of this industrialization and economic development? One of the reasons that Dhaka is one of the fastest growing cities in the world has to do with climate-induced migration. Every year there are um, you know, tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of people who are displaced uh, due to various climate-induced impacts such as river erosion uh, and flooding. And what that results in is um, a lot of unplanned development, for example, low-income communities where people lack basic services, where uh, you might have um, you know, urban flooding, water logging, et cetera, which are challenging to manage. Uh, the Harvard study that just came out recently saying, uh, estimating that one in five global deaths are actually due to the burning of fossil fuels. Um, that is quite stark and, and worth pausing on to uh, also imagine how much benefits in terms of public health we will meet uh, by making this transition rapidly. Thank you, Reese Lott. You've presented so many of the concerns that you have, and rightfully so. I'm curious, how do you think the global economic development model for Bangladesh or any other emerging economy, how do you think it needs to change? We have introduced growth as a proxy for things that we want. Uh, but it's a highly imperfect proxy that does not say anything about the quality of life you want for your people, that does not say anything about the planet that we are literally pushing past the brink in order to uh, strive for that growth. We have created societies where there is so much inequality, and that level of inequality creates an extremely polarized society. And what we need to do that is to really renegotiate and update our social contract to say that enough is enough. Like we need to create a more humane and just society and keep within the planetary boundaries and provide for people. And in many ways, the pandemic has uh, really disrupted our sense of uh, control, our illusion of control and our sense of invincibility that we are not going to be affected. Um, so will we learn the lessons from that is the main question. Thank you, Reese, a lot. Last question. If you had one key takeaway you hope our viewers uh, take from this conversation, what would it be? We have this window of really reimagining how things could look like. And so many different forces are converging um, such that the collective actions that we take as humanity in this decade, in these next few years, will really determine in very deep ways the future of human civilization as well as potentially life itself on our planet for thousands of years to come, maybe even more. Um, and this history is being written before our eyes. Each of us have a choice, um, whether we will be bystanders or will we find the page of that history book or the sentence, the phrase, the word, or even a comma um, in that book that is ours to write. Super insightful. Thank you so much for joining us today, Risa Lott. Up next, we are going to turn to our second expert guest. He is the chair of the Grantham Research Institute for Climate Change and the Environment at the London School of Economics. He is Lord Nicholas Stern. Hello and welcome, Lord Stern. We are so happy to have you with us today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me. In today's episode, we're particularly exploring the correlation between global development and CO2 emissions. And I was wondering if you can tell us more about your research in this area and even potentially the link to the environmental Kuznets curve. Well, the idea of the environmental Kuznets curve, which is roughly 30 years or so old, is that uh, as incomes go up, you can either afford to or your preferences are actually to do so, to cut uh, the pollutions that your activities are causing. If you plot, as it were, pollution against income uh, or income per capita, it first goes up and then goes down as you start to take actions. And you can afford to take actions to cut it. 
to be honest, I, I don't think the econometric or statistical foundations for it uh, are that good because people can take choices at any level of income and, and they do. Um, but that's the idea of the environmental Kuznets curve. And what do you think about that specific link between emissions and global economic development? So there's the production side of it, if you like, that associates economic activity with energy and energy with carbon. But of course, you can change that. You can change the amount of energy you use, but often actually energy use will go up with uh, output. But what you really can break is the relationship between energy and carbon. And that's a choice. Um, of course, there's the whole question of, of what we do with our forests and our land use as well. And we can let economic activity encroach on our forests and the environment or and our biodiversity, or we can act to control that. So there's those two forces at work, you know, output energy carbon and extra activity encroaching on our natural environment and undermining our natural capital. Those two forces at work are real forces, but of course they can be changed. In the West, we have seen CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions already uh, go down. Is that something that uh, should make us hopeful about reaching uh, you know, net zero by 2050? Yes, it tells us that you can grow without increasing your emissions. In my own country, the UK, you know, since 1990, we've probably grown by about 70%, emissions cut by around 40%, just in very round uh, numbers. So that's uh, perfectly possible. If you make those investments, then actually you can get a stronger, more attractive, more inclusive, uh, more resilient form of growth. So it's not simply a decoupling story if you take the right kind of policies to clean up your energy. I think it's actually becoming stronger than that, that the kinds of investments we need to make to change our energy, to invest in our natural capital, are actually investments with very powerful returns beyond simply the very important one of cutting carbon emissions. So I think it should give us hope and it should point to the developing countries new options now. They don't have to go through the dirty phase, which we sadly went through as rich countries because they're different ways of doing things. That's a very positive message. And, and especially also because we heard earlier from Risalat, Risalat who comes from Bangladesh and who's very concerned uh, that as his country uh, develops, which it is very rapidly doing so right now, um, that in fact it is still leading to a lot more pollution. So do you see indeed that, that positive uh, future ahead also for uh, countries like Bangladesh, India and China? Oh, absolutely. The uh, energy sector is the most important from the point of view of the emissions of Greenhouse gases, obviously, burning um, fossil fuels gives you CO2. And it is now possible to do things in different ways. And we do not have to get our electricity from uh, fossil fuels. It's as simple as that. And it's actually cheaper to do it without the fossil fuels. Most in this last year or two of auctions in the Indian power sector have seen round the clock solar beat out fossil fuels for the cheap supply of electricity. So that's the kind of activity which should give us hope. It means that the developing world can build its infrastructure in very different ways from the past. Obviously, we're talking about stakeholder capitalism. It's the theme of this show. What are those key changes that we need to see in our current economic model to put us on a better trajectory? That's absolutely the right question, Natalie. There are two sorts of investments that I would highlight. Investments in physical capital and sustainable infrastructure and investment in natural capital, restoring degraded land, expanding, not contracting our forests and so on. And there are actions with wonderful returns in terms of you know, cities where you can move and breathe, more efficiency, greater productivity, ecosystems which are robust and fruitful and reduced risk of climate change and more resilient economies. But we do have to make those investments. So then the question is, well, what policies can draw through those investments? One important policy will be a price of carbon, but that's not the only one. We have to invest in R&D, 
good functioning grid systems mean that you can take in electricity from all sorts of different sources at all sorts of different times. So you have to organize those systems well. Transport, we have to move quickly away from the internal combustion engine. One way of doing that, of course, price of carbon will help, but we can also regulate saying that you cannot sell, as we will do in the UK uh, after 2030, you cannot sell internal combustion engine cars. You cannot take that kind of car into a city. And those regulations can be very powerful. So you're going to need the right kind of prices, taxes, subsidies. You're going to need the right kind of regulation. And the rich world has to work with the poorer world to help with uh, drawing through those kinds of investments. That includes sharing some know-how, it includes some help with finance, uh, lowering the cost of capital and uh, increasing the flow of capital. So managing change is a complicated business, but the change itself is extremely attractive and it's urgent and it's perfectly feasible. You've made the point of why it's so important to make these changes and also that they're rather straightforward. They're not mysterious, you said. Um, why do you think we have failed to make this, these changes at a massive scale uh, until uh, right uh, just a few years ago? Why, why did it take so long? Since the Paris Agreement of 2015, that international agreement, I think, provided a great deal of acceleration. That's only half a dozen years ago. I think over the last few years, particularly the last three years or so, we've started to see the new technologies come through still more quickly. Now, the electric car now, all the major car manufacturers are making electric cars, and actually most of them are saying we will not make the internal combustion engine after a certain date in the future. You have seen the importance of the idea of net zero, and I think that has changed the way in which people think about things. We've had pressure from young people. They have been taught about climate change. It's clear. For them also, they understand the technologies that are available. So if you put the international agreement, the technological change, the understanding of net zero pressures, particularly from young people, you start to see why things are accelerating, but still not fast enough. Thank you, Professor Stern, for sharing your insights with us. It's been very good to be with you. Thank you. In part one of our episode, we were joined by Professor Stern and Risa Lot Khan, who equally advocated for the need for a new global economic development model that keeps our carbon footprint in check. To demonstrate positive trends and potential solutions, we're joined next by Mariana Matsukatu. Mariana is Professor of Economics in Innovation and Public Value and also the Director of the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London. She also just published her best-selling book, Mission Economy, a moonshot guide to changing capitalism. Welcome, Mariana. Thank you, Peter. It's great to be here. Professor, we just heard from Lord Nicholas Stern, who told us that net zero is possible, but it's not going to be easy. I'm curious, you said we need to save capitalism from itself. What does this mean, especially in the context of, climate, of the climate crisis? My thesis is that we have the wrong type of capitalism. There's varieties, and we need to restructure it if we are going to take climate change seriously. And the fact we have so many companies that continue to you know, prefer just increasing their share prices and often the interrelationship between the government and the business sector is often what I would call a parasitic ecosystem, not a symbiotic one. All of those different problems need to be changed if we're going to take climate change seriously. But I don't think we can just keep looking at the symptoms. We have to go to the structural kind of uh, foundations and change how we do policy, how we do business, and especially how we form better types of public-private partnerships. You would give the example of how in 1960 nobody thought we could ever reach the moon, yet with the right policies in place, we did uh, achieve that by 1970. If we apply that now to the climate crisis, what do we need to do uh, to get to a similar outcome, in which in this case is net zero uh, by 2050? Well, first of all, we need to treat it with the same level of urgency with the Apollo mission that I write about in my book. You know, Kennedy was really, really clear that it was gonna require lots of experimentation. He said, we're gonna do this because it's hard. 
not because it's easy, but also that it was going to be quite expensive and that there would be failures along the way. I think what this requires is an admission that it's going to be hard. But if we actually do it properly, in other words, form healthy public-private partnerships, base it around also a system of innovation that looks both at the kind of R&D that people like Bill Gates talk about, but also the demand side policies that are really crucial in terms of actually making sure that we fully deploy and diffuse these new technologies that are so central also for fighting global warming. That just requires a very different type of public policy, one that I call market creating and shaping, not just market fixing. But also what I found so interesting when I was doing the research for the book is how NASA at the time really cared to actually redesign their policies. And in fact, that led to huge amounts of innovations across so many different sectors. You know, this is really important with um, global warming. We need every sector to innovate. And one other thing I found fascinating in terms of the public-private partnership side is that NASA also had a clause or clauses inside their contracts that had to do with no excess profits. In other words, of course, companies should make profits. This is not about charity. It's not about philanthropy, but you know, it's not about turning this into a gambling casino. You know, the profits should be fair given that it's an outcome of a collective value creation. And that means admitting that the public sector has taken risks, is investing often in the early stage, much more difficult stage of innovation. So the way I sometimes put it as a one-liner is that with the green deal, we don't just need the green bit to be thought about, but also the deal. What's the right contract? What's the right way to share the rewards and not just the risks? How can the public sector incentivize, in the most effective ways, private actors uh, to reduce their emissions? There should be conditionality attached to any sort of government subsidy, guarantee, or investment. And what's interesting was that recently in Germany, for example, when the steel sector asked for a large loan to the government, they did something that many countries haven't done, which is that that subsidy to a sector that is finding itself in trouble because it's, a, it's an older sector, the loan was conditional on steel reducing its material content. Um, and they did it through repurpose, reuse, recycle uh, technologies throughout the whole value chain. Today, they have one of the most sustainable uh, and, and innovative, in some ways, steel uh, manufacturing uh, processes. And so really what we need in order to get you know, carbon neutral manufacturing across all our different sectors, but also distribution, is to put this at the center of the contracts in that way you know, with conditionality. But unless it's actually embedded as a mandatory change that has to happen, as opposed to relying on kind of voluntary uh, actions, then I just don't think we're going to get there on time. Mariana, we also saw how the challenge of getting to zero may be harder in emerging economies uh, because they're still on a development path where they naturally would emit more CO2, more greenhouse gases. What, what are some of the solutions uh, that you foresee in, in such economies and for such governments and companies? There's many different points that I would raise on that. But the first is that the developed world has to definitely take on the greatest burden, which doesn't mean that developing countries shouldn't change. Of course they must, but it has to be facilitated by those countries that have you know, historically in the last kind of 200 years led the problem. What's interesting is for countries that are developing, sometimes this need to build infrastructure, for example, especially in countries with very weak infrastructure, you know, that seems like that's the priority. Let's do that first, and then we can worry about kind of global warming later. And I think that's a mistake. I think in developing countries where there's both an urgency to develop and to build that infrastructure, having a green lens and a green design lens to building the infrastructure is absolutely crucial. And I think that need to innovate with the tools, grants, loans, procurement, or if you have a public bank, a development bank, as many uh, developing countries have, it's really important to get out of the kind of mentality of just giving out money and handouts to different uh, organizations away from that and actually have a mission-oriented, outcomes-oriented goal and using climate uh, targets for those goals and using that to then cause investment in innovation in the business sector, of which we often have too little in developing countries by putting those conditionalities that I talked about earlier at the center. This is, I think, a way to really catalyze investment in countries that actually have a low business investment. Mariana, as we close this episode, do you have a clear call to action? Yes, well, we need to remember, as I said, there's different ways to do capitalism and we're doing it wrong. And we have to stop you know, sticking with the ideology of government or private sector. We need to change the governance models of both government and the private sector, but especially 
build that healthy partnership. And anyone who's interested in stakeholder value in the business community or talks about purpose-led change, it has to go not just within the corporate governance, but in the relationship. Just like in a marriage, you know, there can be healthy marriages and dysfunctional marriages. I really think we have a dysfunctional relationship right now between the public and private sector. And so that's my call for action. Get symbiotic partnerships and let's use that in order to bring purpose at the center of the system. So to fight climate change, we need a mission-oriented economy, not just focusing on technologies, but also on the right public policies and public-private cooperation. Thank you so much, Mariana, for joining us. Thank you for having me on the show. It's been great. And then you can, of course, also read all about Mariana's solutions in her new book, Mission Economy, A Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism. Welcome back. In this episode, we've been exploring how we can pursue economic growth without harming the planet for future generations. Peter, what did you hear in today's episode that you think presents a better way forward? Well, first of all, uh, we've heard from Risalat how not to do it. Uh, he joined us, you know, talking about his country, Bangladesh, which is clearly on the road to economic development. Um, and you would expect they would follow the template that has been set before them uh, by all other industrialized nations, which is to, you know, build uh, factories, to build energy plants, and therefore also uh, continue to or, or start to emit more CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions. But he said, I don't want that. If, if this is the price we have to pay for economic development, I don't, I don't like that option. And so that's the first thing I think we have to remember is that that way forward is not one we can uh, continue to follow. And what was very interesting is Lord Nicholas Stern, he highlighted, he agreed with Riesela actually, but he said climate action is possible. We can revert this crisis. It's not going to be easy, but we do have options. What were the options that stood out to you? Well, it, you know, what was very surprising, I think, uh, was that he said, and he's been looking at this issue for decades, and he said, you know, the solutions are there, and he said many of them come from the last two to three years, technological solutions to make sure you can decouple economic development uh, from uh, CO2 emissions. And I think that's very striking to know that this option is now there. It wasn't there before. It is now here, um, but it's very recent. Yeah. He also highlighted, though, that industrial uh, nations, industrialized nations, need to have a disproportionate uh, impact on finding solutions and scaling those solutions around the world. What did you think about what he said around international responses uh, and working together across countries to find solutions and scale them? Well, it, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Because if you look at how much greenhouse gases we have historically emitted, which is the right way to look at it, of course, because they remain in the atmosphere for a very long time, it's only right that those countries that have emitted the most over the, li or the lifetime, let's say, uh, would bear the biggest burden. So that implies that if the edge is there, if, if new technological solutions are there, um, that those countries would implement them first, straight away, and would also uh, try to help in implementing them elsewhere as well as soon as possible. And I think that brings us to you know, what Mariana uh, said in, in the end, the change has to happen now, right? I think Mariana was one of the most inspiring guests we've had on the show so far. And when she says we need a moonshot approach to solving the climate crisis, it's now, it's not in decades in the future, it's this decade. And she also said all stakeholders, government, society, business, they all have a role to play in challenging the climate crisis, taking climate action, but also rethinking capitalism. And what a powerful message to end on. That brings us to the end of this episode. Next episode, we'll focus on the role of technology and our ever-growing dependence on it. And we'll particularly ask the question, is big tech too big? Thanks for joining today's episode, and we'll see you next time.